it makes for a different game a lot of the time. I guess he would know dying four times in one session, how that can create a different experience with every life. State of Survival Podcast, bringing you survival game news. And welcome in, folks, with us to the State of Survival Podcast. This week, we're going to be talking about Project Zomboid and its many cool things. But before we get into the nitty gritty of all this amazing stuff and learn more about it, let's go ahead and talk about our staff. So first up, uh, y'all goats, how's it going? It's going well. Uh, I'm a little annoyed because I have jury duty that I seemingly can't get out of starting next week, but I'm hoping that I can pull a magic trick out of my hat and get dismissed. But other than that, streams have been great. We've been playing a lot of Project Zomboid some party games on the weekend and uh, it looks like we're going to be playing day z on thursday and i'm super excited for that but i won't say why <laughs> oh sounds good secret secret secrets all right and then next up we're going to be asking our producer red falcon how is he doing and what's he up to i'm up to about 510 as usual um hmm. just dealing with the aftermath of the day z 1.21 a patch release uh, this morning and all the fun that's ensuing from that. Oh, yeah? So did you have any major problems with the 1.21? You said all that fun. <clears throat> yeah, so it uh, broke a few different mods. Um, uh, oh. we had, yeah, we had problems with uh, uh, Deer Isle was one of them that had some challenges. There were some things that cropped up with Trader Plus that were a little unusual. And then looking at my mods with the helicopters, they're, they all work, but now the helicopters seem to go about twice as fast as they did before for no real reason. So people or players are happy about that, but I got to go in and figure out what's going on. Definitely, definitely. Well, that's really interesting to hear about, and uh, hopefully things end up working out. <laughs> I think everybody's thinking that. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Well, folks, and then finally, there is me. I have been actually out of the house dog sitting for my friend. He has a chocolate Labrador, and her name is Penny. And she is just a bundle of energy. And for some reason, thinks that she's still a puppy and tries to literally <laughs> drag you around and lay on top of you as much as she can. But in other news, my mods all seem to have gone pretty well. Of course, if you are one of my viewers watching this, please, please make sure when you're testing the mods, if you find any bugs or anything else that are deemed as exploits, DM me the message. Do not post it publicly. I do not want to see them publicly. If they post it publicly, I will delete them and let you know why I deleted them. But I will, of course, take note. But... In other regards, I have been enjoying looking over the patch notes for 1.21, and I cannot wait to actually dive into it, folks. So let's go ahead and do some other things, because I'm saying a word way too much now, Chase, that I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about, Dump. Don't know what you're talking about. Not at all. <laughs> yes, folks. Uh, but uh, I am going to be handing the baton over to Yarl of Goats this week to be able to lead and carry on the episode from this point forward. So be nice to him, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Dump. One of the things that I've been talking with Dump about that I'm passionate about are survival games that give you more than one way to survive in any given environment. Whether it's base building, trying to get the best loot in the highest tiers, or wandering off in the woods and surviving and foraging off the fat of the land. But that's also something that not every game does equally. With games like Sons of the Forest, for example, it's got tremendously well-designed base building. But its primitive survival is very shallow and short-lived. And there's something to embrace with either the base building or foraging lifestyle. And that's what we're going to look at today. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like a really fun topic to talk about. I'm actually quite excited to get into it. Oh, I am too. I am too. And uh, we actually played Project Zomboid on stream last week that I'm uh, actually super excited to go over because I think that highlights kind of our mentality. We were trying to decide how we were going to play. So it should be a lot of fun. So you're 
were talking about the live stream, huh? Yes, we were playing Project Zomboid, which I love streaming that game. You could stream with a big group or a small group. And we were actually streaming with, we had you, myself, and another streamer that we frequently collab with, Dimension119. And in fact, if you guys want to check out Dimension 119 as we tell the hilarious stories of his survival, his link is in the description below. Please do check him out. We were trying to decide on what would be an interesting survival aspect of Project Zomboid. And one of the things that we fell upon was starting off in Louisville. So, if it, or Louisville, as the people from Kentucky are, you know, reminding me constantly, even though it was named after Prince Louis, but that, that's okay. That's despite the point. <laughs> uh, surviving in Louisville can be tricky. Surviving in Louisville does provide you with a lot of food, a lot of technology that you can have access to. Oftentimes it's easier to get guns. But what makes Louisville very difficult is it's out of the way from the other settlements and cities. And it's just so dangerous. In fact, while you're scavenging for resources, shelter, and high tier weapons, one of the things that you got to worry about is the population of the natives. Dub and I were talking about it. How many zombies are there in Louisville? Well, it would surprise you that on 1x population, there's upwards of 55,000 zombies. As you can see, somebody's painstakingly put a grid together of the entire Louisville map, and they've counted how many zombies spawn in diff by default inside the buildings, as well as how many zombies spawn by default outside the buildings. And as you can see, 55,727 zombies on 1X. Dump, what's your preferred setting when you play Project Zomboid as far as population goes? Well, I would have to say I like with the vanilla populations because when you think about just the vanilla populations and you look at those numbers, it's pretty crazy to think about that there are that many registered and possible zombies in just that area alone. Now, mind you, I know... I'm going to butcher this. Louisville. Louisville. Louisville? Oh, my God. Louisville. <laughs> it's... Think, think Lua, like... A Luau? Ville. Louisville. Oh. Louisville. Okay, okay, I get it. I get it. Louisville. 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 Louisville language. Lu and it's Louisville. Ville. Yeah. Louisville. Named after okay, Prince gotcha. Lua. From France. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. But um, I agree with you. If, if you set it up any higher than 1x, you're I mean, at 2x, you're talking about 110,000 zombies, close to 111,000. And even when you're talking about 3x, like some people play on, I don't think Louisville would be very uh, possible with a 3x population. Oh, it, it's crazy to think about that. Folks, this is one of the scariest things about playing Project Zomboid. It's not the fact that the zombies themselves are tanky or anything else. It's not the fact that there's lack of food or whatever else. It's the fact that these infected or these zombies are so large in number, they can overrun anything. If you folks ever want to see the dangers of these zombies, look up my base versus these zombies and you will actually see people who literally lose their entire bases because a helicopter flew over it is insane about what these numbers can mean because uh i believe if, if i remember right, right Jarl, uh that can't there be like more than like five thousand zombies on the screen at one time it's a massive yes. number yes i had a uh, mistake where i had to go rescue a friend from the mall who was trapped outside and by the time we got there the car alarms that were going off had attracted a solid blob I, this thing looked like a, a rob zombie mosh pit at one of his concerts it was just shoulder to shoulder zeds everywhere you looked and even though i have a really good gaming pc with the 3060 in it the moment i approached the parking lot the game crashed <laughs> wow that is crazy, though, to think about just how well the game actually can perform with quite a few numbers. Um, and it's 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 scary because there are just so many things you've got to think about when dealing with them, because they will mow through anything to get to you. And that's, Absolutely. again, like I said, the scary part. Um, I mean, just 
What do you do, Jarl, when you have a massive horde after you? Like, what are your tricks to try to avoid such a large horde? I walk away. I walk away. Uh, sometimes I'll put throw some gasoline down and try to burn them because once you light them on fire, they kind of catch each other on fire. But at that point, survival's not really attainable. Walk away and go somewhere else. <laughs> but that brings us to where we chose to live. We actually chose to live on a mansion that's by the river in Louisville. And when I choose a place, I don't think about how many zombies might be there. Instead, what I'm thinking of is the story, because that's really what Project Zomboid is about. This is how you die. It's not this is how you win or someday you'll be lifted off by a helicopter. You will die. That's the whole point of Project Zomboid. But with all of its role play mechanics and character creation, I think story is so important. So when we started off this stream, and as you could see up on the uh, screen there and for those who can't see we have a two-story house and in the same driveway we have a three-car garage that also has two stories so it's a remarkable place to have a lot of people to tear it apart make your own but it fits our story i was playing as dr spencer and dr spencer is kind of a selfish arrogant doctor who really doesn't like treating people he only did it for the money before now that the money's gone, he's kind of grumpy. And while well, we start off the stream with him inviting two of his best friends over, Andrew and Gramps. <laughs> uh, what did you think of the location as far as story-wise goes? I, I thought it fit. The, the, the location definitely fitted the kind of like doctor who's made an okay living uh, overall. And... <laughs> Listen, um, I didn't have any cars in the garage, but that's not my fault. It was left at the hospital. Yeah, his his Ferrari was left at the hospital, folks. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> no, I really enjoyed it because it was large enough to make it feel like we could actually store and organize stuff. Um, that's one of the problems I have with some of the smaller home starts is that um, they feel difficult because there's not enough room to store stuff which can be a level of difficulty but i like this one because it felt really nice because we were having uh you know three of us playing together and uh that really did make it a lot more enjoyable oh absolutely i think my favorite thing about this place too is the security as you could see the front of it has an iron rot fence or no gate just a fence apparently i didn't make that much money at the hospital uh but with some careful carpentry and construction, you could seal the front off of that really easily. Those fences on the sides are too tall for zombies to hop over, although they can still break through. They go all the way back, except for the last two spaces by the river. So all you gotta do is patch up those with walls, potentially doors, so that you have an escape path. And it's a pretty secure place. But the one thing that it doesn't have is once you're buttoned up like that, it's not easy to go out and get supply, which is why I chose the neighborhood that we're in. Um, the supply is definitely critical there in the neighborhood. Uh, I believe to the south, and it's a little weird because it's an isometric map, so it takes people a little while to get used to. But to the south, we have a hospital. That, that was kind of part of the story too. I wanted to be close to the hospital. I mean, I have a Ferrari, but I'm not gonna put miles on it. I'll just drive down the street to work. Up to the north, we've got a gas station and a brewery. Uh, the gas station, of course, where role-playing belongs to Gramps. And then if you head to the east, you can hit up the horse track and the university before even setting foot in downtown, which is the really dangerous part. So really, when you're looking at the entire map, we have everything we need, but we still have to go and get it. We still have to put ourselves in danger to get those supplies. Yeah. You are very much right on that. And I, I actually enjoyed the situation uh, more or less because like you said, we really have to find the supplies, but we also have to think more strategically because we can't just go and get supplies with let's say a vehicle 100% because the zombies will follow your car back to your home. And like Jarl mm -hmm. said, we can build our own uh, fortifications and stuff. But like I said a little bit earlier, folks, if you get a large enough horde, they will break down those fortifications and tear through everything you have done. So you almost have to have a little bit more tact in this kind of a situation. 
Which brings us to the highlights of the stream and what I thought was really funny about it. My favorite thing was we intentionally chose a mansion by the river because at level one fishing, you can go out and catch a fish with enough calories that it'll last you quite a while. But none of us fished. Like you could get a 10,000 calorie fish that'll last a week to one person. We didn't even do that. We were like, nope, we're going out into the danger zone. Uh, but as you can see in uh, the image we have displayed just shows the three of us. Dimension 119 is playing Gramps. Uh, we've got Dump Graw is playing Andrew and myself, who's playing Dr. Spencer. Uh, we had a really comforting first day in our house watching TV. And having that home without having to worry about being bombarded by 55,000 zombies, gave us the opportunity to watch TV like you would in any other settlement without having to look over your back constantly. Uh, but if I recall that first night we were watching TV, we still had some annoying neighbors show up uninvited. We had to go clean them out a little bit. <laughs> I mean, yeah, definitely. I think the most annoying thing there was the fact that your guy didn't have beer. Like, who doesn't have beer <laughs> to watch TV while the world ends? <laughs> I, I sent out an invite to those two and said, beer and television, and I didn't have any beer. So obviously I lied. But hey, you're there now and you're stuck. So you're trapped. Maybe we'll go stop by the brewery and read that the next time we play. Um, there were a couple really cool moments of the stream, too. Uh I think one of my favorite things about that area is the foraging. I took outdoorsmen and the herbalist so that I could get some medicinal herbs. And every 24 hours, the trash piles and the, the forests around you will respawn loot for you to forage. I didn't have to go very far to get everything. But the coolest thing was how quick Dumpgra was able to erect a wooden wall at the base of the driveway with a door. Allowed us access in. He's not quite at the level to pick up a gate. You know, I'm getting the idea that maybe Andrew's not very smart, but we'll get to that point. But <laughs> well, we <shit>. were. <laughs> uh, but to the east, we did find cars at the horse track that were in working condition. Uh, what, what was something amazing that you thought was really cool about that that night? Uh, I found it. I thought it was awesome that we found some cars with keys and that we were able to get them up and running. While I think we heard the distant cries of our buddy <laughs> trying to survive oh, right. yes. against the horde. You know so, what? Before uh, we before we even talk about Gramps, we asked uh, Dimension what he thought of the game because he's probably only put like 10 hours and he gave us some really good feedback for somebody who is uh brand new to the game and i want to read what he wrote because it was very thoughtful so this is from dimension 119 as a person with only 18.7 hours in projects on void i guess you could say i'm still learning it don't worry buddy you could have a thousand hours and still learn the game i promise you that I get most of the enjoyment when I can play with others. The game seems to lend itself well to some light role play. And I really do enjoy when we get a group together and act out and voice our characters the best we can. My favorite thing about Project Zomboid. That being said, I also enjoy the challenges this game brings, both with the different traits, positive and negative that you have to sign in, uh, that you can have. It makes for a different game a lot of the time. I guess he would know dying four times in one session, how that can create a different experience with every life. Um, the first time you play a deaf person, you realize how different some of the traits make it. That's true, because being deaf, if, if you have like easily, you know, panicked, being deaf kind of prevents that because you're not aware of what's going around you unless you're looking at it. Uh, I never really thought of it that way. Um, this is a game that I absolutely love to play with friends. As for solo, I die very quickly, but I enjoy the challenge of attempting to stay alive. My biggest struggle is timing the attacks and fending off the zombies. I look forward to del delving deeper, spending more time playing, and getting more solo practice in. They say after 10,000 hours, you're considered an expert at something. I don't know if I will ever achieve 10,000 hours in the game, but I will definitely never be an expert at it. <laughs> Hashtag bad at games. Well, dimension honestly i don't i was talking with dump about this a while ago but this game's one of those games that you don't measure your experience in hours it's how many times you died and i'd say you're you're getting that expert badge pretty quickly uh here we are in the road traveling by these cars and i was explaining to dimension that you can scrap them for mechanics xp and with a mere handful of zombies 
Gramps 1.0 bit the dust right in front of our eyes. Uh, and there was very little we could do about it. I know it looks like Dr. Spencer is walking casually over there. It was a jog. I did have some haste, uh, but <laughs> Dump's character Andrew was all over the place. He was very good at melee, which I thought was great. But that's not the only time. I remember getting separated uh, from Dimension in a parking lot. Uh, if we could queue up the next slide. And I didn't know what happened to him, but I ended up finding him by a cyclone fence. And Gramps 2.0, unfortunately, also had to be put down. Gramps 3.0 and Gramps 4.0 aren't on there because he died in the middle of the night in a huge mob of zombies, and we really had a hard time fighting him. So we ended up recovering his body the next day. But uh, I, I, that's what I love about the game. You could die a bunch. You could survive on one life. The game's still a lot of fun. Yeah. No, it definitely is. Uh, there's, And the, the thing that makes the game fun is that every death is unique. Um, and that's what makes, I think, dying the re reason why you learn is that you make different mistakes and those mistakes are what lead to your death eventually. Um, I don't know how many times I've died in Project Zomboid, but it has been more than a fair amount. And every time I die, I almost walk away with a feeling of, oh, that really sucks. I never really ever walk away with a angry feeling of I got cheated or this sucks or whatever. It's always a, I know what I did wrong, and I probably will repeat it, but I'm gonna try not to. My first time playing the game, I, I had a really good handle on it. And the very first time I died was because I found a generator and a generator use magazine, and I put it in my living room so I could power my house. <laughs> and I died of carbon monoxide poisoning in my sleep. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, so there's your little tip for the day. Uh, but, you know, before we delve into this topic further, the stream was great. It was a lot of fun, but it kind of touched on the subject that we're talking about. What's better to forage or to build a base? But before we do that, let's hit our hot takes. Dump Gross, since you've okay. got some exciting news, I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. Well, folks, Daisy 1.21 has been pushed this morning today or for some of you folks maybe yesterday depends on who, when you, where you're watching from but it has been a very interesting time and experimental lots of fixes lots of little tweaks but we did see the um the return of the crossbow and we did see that we got some medieval weaponry including the mace the reintroduction of the two-handed sword and full chainmail with a plate chest and medieval boots now the content in this update was cool because it introduced the new projectile uh, arrow system, which is absolutely really cool. I'm very, very happy with this update overall because there's just so much more to do it and there's so much more possibilities for our modders to explore with, with this new projectile system. I've talked about anything from sticky grenades to um, you know, uh, flying Bettys to even possibly new types of traps for people to encounter inside of bases or outside of bases. Overall, I think this is a fun update and I'm very, very happy with a lot of the things that they've introduced. One of the things that they have done is they have greatly improved upon the FPS issue while inside vehicles. But, oh, yeah. yeah. That's about it. I'm super excited too because one of my favorite traps is putting a little blue, uh, blue gas tank down and shooting it when somebody runs to loot it. Now that we have crossbows, you could do it quietly. So I'm looking forward to that to see what kind of mayhem we can cause. My hot take today is on primitive survival and how it's underrated in a lot of survival games. Usually the games have a tiered loot system, you know, especially we were talking about that last time with DayZ. It's always you spawn on the beach and it's a rush to Northwest Airfield to try to gather the best guns, the best armor, the best gear. But I think they're not really appreciating the scope that games like DayZ and Project Zomboid offer, where you can live off the fat of the land as long as you know how to make the tools. And you don't have to find the tools either. You can craft them using primitive survival. 
very few games utilize both a tiered loot base building system as well as the nomadic wanderer uh, primitive lifestyle. If you wanted to play as a caveman in Daisy, you absolutely could. If you wanted to play as uh, somebody who lives in a trailer or a van by the river in Project Zomboid, you absolutely could. And I think that's key. High tier loot is a luxury. It's not a necessity. And I wish games would embrace that more. As far as Project Zomboid goes, one of the things that it does best to kind of feature that is the new foraging system that came with the last update. What I love about foraging in Project Zomboid is it really encapsulates the raiding junk out of trash, moving to the woods and looking. And as you build up your foraging, you get this wonderful little meter where it tells you in this particular type of vegetation, food is common, uh, firewood's common, and it goes through the rarity all the way through animals, stones, other, and um, medicinal plants, if you have herbalist. This is critical when you're researching, and as you learn more, you'll start to memorize what these zones offer. You need a lighter or you want to find some plant seeds, one of the best ways to do it is go loot a trash pile. You might even find a garbage bag so you could build your water collectors. And it really makes it to where you can hop in a vehicle, go around the map, and that's your character's story. And that's that's what I love. I love primitive survival and survival games. But uh, now, thank you. Mm -hmm. You did say that, uh, you know, Use Daisy and uh, Project Zomboid are examples for primitive survival. But I know you've played a lot of other types of games like Minecraft, Finch Hit Story, Some Days to Die, uh, Son The Forest, Sons of the Forest, uh, just mm -hmm. to name a few. Uh, but what makes you think that Project Zomboid and uh, DayZ stand out from those games? That's a good question. When you when you think of Minecraft as a survival, for example, there's a hard cap where if you have stone tools, you can't get certain ores. So it's a race. Everybody gets their stone tools, and the first thing they look for is iron. Why do they look for iron? Because they're trying to get diamond. And it, it kind of pushes players to accelerate through that high-tier loot. And I feel like games like Sons of a Forest, for example, or even the forest. Yes, you could build a structure to sleep in. Yes, you could find a tent to sleep in, but it requires a structure in order for you to sleep. And a lot of times to build that structure, you have to have supplies that you would have had at the base. I really wish those games would encourage more of the sleeping under the stars or building a makeshift like lean to structure with brush and debris. There's sticks all over the place. Why not use them? Uh, another game that does primitive survival well, I think, is Medieval Dynasty. But again, it's one of those games where through sheer mechanics, it's trying to get you to accelerate to the Iron Age and build your village up. And I think they're missing the point that you can live a successful life with primitive survival. And, and it's something I, I look forward to all the time. Uh, in games like Valheim, you have to have the higher tiered loot in order to be effective in combat. So it's kind of a shame that they, they don't have more games where you could just be a naked caveman in the woods if you wanted to. Nice. Very nice. Well, that's like, well, I'm happy to hear about that. Yes, and we'll actually go into more because I'm sure you've got some opinions on base building or foraging. So let's go ahead and hit our next segment and talk about that. <laughs> So I guess first I'll pass the message to you because I'm sure by the discussion we've had, people can kind of tell which lifestyle I prefer. But what do you prefer in a game like this? Are you a base builder or are you a wanderer? Um, well, one of my friends back when I used to play Minecraft with him all the time, he used to call me, I forget what it was, but it was a nickname for somebody who always moved their bases. And I feel like I'm pretty much a roaming base builder because I don't like to settle in one area for too long in these kinds of situations. One, because I think it's fun to see the rest of the map. And mm -hmm. two, I kind of enjoy base building. Um, I enjoy the challenge of it. I enjoy the designing of it and stuff. And sometimes it's just nice to move away from an amazing base I made and go set up a new base. Maybe I make outposts or maybe I truly move all my operations, but I, I do it for various reasons. One of the very, various reasons could be I run out of lo locations to loop lo um, nearby and the trip becomes way too long to drive. Or 
maybe I just decide that I want to uproot and become, uh, instead of a more urban person, a more rural person, because it gives me a little bit more safety. But no matter what the case is, I always end up building a base. Yeah, see, I'm kind of with you. I prefer the nomadic lifestyle, but being a nomad doesn't mean you don't build a base. It just means every time you move, you start from scratch. You set your fire, your cooking source, you get a water source, and you're doing that cycle over and over again. And that's what I love about it. Because there comes a point in even DayZ or Project Zomboid where if you build your base well enough, the challenge is almost gone, which I think is sad. Um, there are definitely bonuses to both. Um, base building, obviously, security, supply. It turns into more of the long-term game. But I, sometimes I just like hitching a bad trailer up to a really poorly run station wagon in Project Zomboid and just take a few lawn chairs and that's how we're going to live. Uh, and I, I think that both of those games do a really good job of that. But since you and I aren't fans of settling down, let's try to play the devil's advocate and start talking about what we think building a base brings to the table. So for you, what is the value of base building in Project Zomboid? Um, it is a very large value of bases. Super, super large. <laughs> the largest value no, you can come I up feel with. that I can just crush it down and to fit into a oh, very nice crush it too much. Now it's gone. Ah, uh, damn. Let's blow it back up. <laughs> 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 All right, folks. Well, jokes aside. Well, what does uh, base value... building do for the story? Like, like your character's story. What what values does having a base bring your characters? I think a value of a base actually brings um, along overall a sense of it's like setting down roots. It really starts to bind your character to. I'm here to to survive this zombie apocalypse. I'm no longer running scared. I'm no longer trying to find the next safe haven. I am making my own safe haven. This is where I'm going to store my supplies. This is where I'm going to store extra weapons, ammunition, possible vehicles. I'm going to make my own escape route, so on and so on. Bases, in my opinion, symbolize to most people that, that, that tiered system that you were talking about, where it's no longer, I have grown up from being a person running for my life to I'm now going to do exactly what I just said, set up roots. That's such a good point, because from a story perspective, it's like taking the fight to the zombies. You know, at that point, it's about clearing the area. It's about fighting back the pandemic, not just avoiding it entirely. That's a really interesting prospect. I think one of my favorite things about base building is you get a sense of achievement because you can see the progress you've made thus far, which I do think is quite valuable in these games. But also think about the graves and the crosses. One of my favorite things you did in the stream when we were playing is you made graves for Gramps. Every time Gramps died, you went into the backyard and put a little wooden crucifix. I thought that was so funny. If we had a shovel, we would have dug legit graves. but. That's something that you might miss in the nomadic style. Uh, you know, having a place to memorialize those who have fallen. Um, oh, you're totally right. What about security? Like, does space building offer you more security or do you feel like maybe you you have less? I feel like I have a little bit more security. And I guess I think what I should state to people is when I say security, I mean I have more time to react, not necessarily more time to not not necessarily I'm safe. So like, in projects on board, one of the things that I find valuable, I spoke about this a little bit earlier too, was that if enough zombies are at your wall, they will bust it down in no time, and that's kind of the cool thing about Project Zomboid base building is that. Your bases are just a deterrent. They're not mm -hmm. a forever fence. And I right. think that's kind of what I enjoy about that kind of situation. 
I do too, and I like what you brought up because when you do design a base in Project Zomboid, you kind of want to build it like Minas Tirith, multiple fallback zones, uh, because it really is a tower defense game at that point. When you have hordes of zombies beating on your outer wall, what's, what's plan B, what's plan C? And I think having a fixed base really encapsulates that idea of tactical and strategic thought when it comes to the protection of your people. And like you said, just being able to react and also guide the zombies to certain choke points or kill boxes, I think that's a really valuable part of base building. Now, about yourself. I I think my favorite thing about it is just having a place where you can get out of the elements because Project Zomboid, a lot of people don't even make it to the winter. And for those folks, I say buckle up because until you make it to the winter, you start to value the amenities that uh, a home could provide or a base could provide. Even if you're building the base from scratch and you don't have a fireplace, you can always go find a wood stove north, you know, west of Muldrow. I know there's a warehouse inside Muldrow that has one. They are out on the map, so you could get yourself some warmth. Uh, and that's cool too, because you're still traveling. How about for supply? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, supplies? Uh, I was going to say, fun fact, I folks have never actually made it to winter. Really? Oh, man, it's so brutal, but I love it. I love it so much. That's my goal, then. In this playthrough of Dimension, I want to get us to winter because it is so exciting. It's so good. Uh, now, as far as supply goes with fixed spaces, like we've situated ourselves on the river, I think supply is critical with a base. But like you had mentioned in your example with Daisy and survival games you play, unless you plan on farming or fishing, there will come a point where there's just not enough supply in the area to keep you uh, satiated. So what what's your opinion as far as base building goes with supply line? Only use what you think you need. So when I think, oh, I guess less is more is a good statement in this case, especially in that kind of mentality where you're going to not fish or farm or forage. Make sure that for the resources that you have in your area, you kind of do a little bit of math mathematics on it. Hey, the starting house, the houses that I have around me, let's say your next door neighbor houses, this is what they had. Well, if I consider that, how many of the how many of the houses around me will I go out to before I'm gonna have to move base? And in that regard, maybe you'll just board up the windows. Maybe you'll put curtains on the windows and stuff. And maybe you'll put some uh, some walls outside. But you won't spend a whole lot of time trying to fortify that one home because the more and more effort you put into it, the more and more time you have wasted um, when you leave it to go somewhere else because that area has more of the resources you need to survive. Because in Project Zomboid, I do believe this, uh, in vanilla, most of the resources do not respawn very often. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite rare. I agree. And in fact, I think that brings us to our first con of base building, right? Is that you do, you will eventually have to move if you don't create a renewable source of food and supply and in the winter plants don't grow very well so you can't just say oh i'll farm you're still going to have to find ways to get out there and at some point it'll be too far away from the base then you'll have to start over and that's great if you love base building but if you just spent all this time building a fortress and eventually you're going to have to move and do it again that could be a con of base building yeah, definitely. And there's another thing to consider here, too, when it comes to supply. Even if you fish, forage, or farm, farming, it has infestations. You can lose your entire yield of your mm -hmm. planted crops. Fishing, it's not unlimited. It has a limit of how much fish. It will eventually replenish if you're fishing on a main river. But if you're fishing, let's say, next to a pond or a lake, it does have a finite number of fish. And then finally, forging. Uh, yeah, like you're all set, you changed the settings so was, uh, forging was better. Well, forging also has finite resources. That's the thing folks need to remember about Project Zomboid is everything is finite. Actually, with the new forging system, every 24 hours it replenishes. 
That's oh, why foraging I... is king. But no, you're right. Based on other iterations of it, like that was literally one of the last major updates. Before, once you foraged an area, there was nothing left behind. Uh, but even then, every 24 hours going out for foraging, praying that you get what you need, but only ending up with newspapers, now you got to wait a whole other 24 hours before you can hit those safe zones. It's still not a very practical way to live in a solid space. Yeah. Now let's go on to my preferred method, which is nomadic life. And like, as you said, it's it's a build as you go system for me. Um, okay. Sometimes I'll take a car and I'll fill it up with the necessities that I need to live, whether it's a propane barbecue or something. But for me, being able to just drive out into the woods or pull off into a rest stop and clearing it and staying there for the night, looting it for resources. Usually when I'm a nomad, sometimes I'm there for five days and then I move on. I'm never in one spot. And as far as story goes, I think that's the coolest thing because your character goes on this journey. I always compare it to Lord of the Rings when they went to Mount Doom to get rid of the ring. That's what it feels like for being a nomad for me in a zombie game because it's just got all of those. Uh, there are trapping options, uh, 330T, but they're not very good right now. You can catch things like rats and stuff like that. But to be honest, until the hunting update comes out, it just doesn't do a whole lot for health. And in wintertime, trapping almost slows to a stop. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite thing is story-wise with no being nomadic like if you could envision andrew the character that we were streaming with being a nomad what kind of positives could you get out of that experience well i think it would be less and more attachment to people and what i mean by that is that i will feel like every person i come across is a gold mine a person that i want to save no matter what um but also, if when if and when I do lose them, I am back to being self-sufficient. So one of the one of the things people have to consider with being a nomad, in my view, is you have to be able to provide for yourself. Now, when you find other people, that's great, but you still have to remember you can't start to rely on them too hard because they will die, or you will die, and you'll leave them alone. Either way, I think that's kind of the thing I like about nomads. Yeah, and once you're a nomad, I think trapping also has more of a purpose because then you can, you know, trap the small game while you go, while you're focusing on rebuilding your campsite, rebuilding your base, setting out your resources. Uh, it's not so much about holding up, looting a grocery store, or going out and doing some long-term fishing. You could survive on the quick bites a little more. Uh, whereas with bait, base maintenance, it takes a lot of nutrition to sit there and build walls and stuff, and you burn through your food a lot quicker. Well, one of the things that you pointed out, and this is a mod you put on the server, was that you have um, you put a mod that half the weight of lumber, um, of the planks and stuff, and that was absolutely necessary, I think, uh, to actually make our us be able to play that short amount of time and do stuff. But hauling around regular planks and lumber. If you are overweight, folks, you hurt yourself a lot. So when you're mm -hmm. building bases, you can actually not only slow yourself majorly down, but you can also put yourself in a situation where you don't have a lot of health. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons, Dump and I actually sat down before we started the stream and calculated the real weight of a piece of two by four versus how much it weighs in days uh, Project Zomboid. And honestly, when you look at some of Project Zomboid's numbers on weight, it's like, ah, uh, that's a little excessive. That was the other reason why I did it, uh, was so that you could carry more than one or two two by fours if you're a survivor. But uh, now let's move on to probably something though nomadic life has some bonuses in. What about security? What's the security of being a nomad like? Well, it's actually pretty kind of equal. It's half and half in my view. The the cons of it, the, the pros of it, are the fact that you're always moving, so you're always finding new things, new axes, new crowbars, whatever, melee-wise, new clothing stuff. But the con is also the same exact thing. You're also putting yourself into situations where you actually might get um, into kind of a bind. 
Uh, I know a lot of people like to back away while they're fighting a horde or a large group of uh, zombies, but that also means that you have a blind spot on your back, and if you don't have anybody watching your back, then you don't know if you're walking into another horde. So that's why mm -hmm. people always try to swivel around a lot, but reality is, the more you're by yourself and the more you're being nomadic means the more you're running around looting places. So yeah. it kind of can become problematic. I mean, you can't take your all's approach and go completely primitive, but most people like to go and loot things. So you'll eventually encounter that situation. Yeah, and I, I still rely on loot, even with my nomadic lifestyle, because although the security of it is you could just pack up and go, there's nothing long term. You're not leaving anything severe behind if you have to grab your car and leave. Uh, big whoop. We got to find another cooking pot somewhere. But the biggest problem with it is if you're living in the woods, you also have to realize that the trees obstruct your visual radius and how well you could see threats coming. And you can't exactly run through the trees. If you're too careless and you do that, you'll get cut up and injured. So it can be a little frustrating. But I think that security wise, the bonus to losing a base and having to start over is your carpentry skills by then way leveled up. So is your farming skill. So it's not so much of a detriment, but if you're a nomad and let's say you go to the river to buy water, when you get back, your car is surrounded by undead. That's it. You have nothing. And that's when you have to start over. So there, there's definitely some bonuses to it. I find that thrilling and exciting. And if you're really good at primitive survival, you build yourself some stone axes and continue again, find yourself a new car. But there's still something sentimental, like like Dump Girl was saying, that connection with people and how much you cherish it. You're also connected to your vehicle. Your, your vehicle almost becomes your home, another character in the group. So when you lose that, yikes. And then of course there's supply. The beauty of being a nomad is you know, where you had to regulate your resources in a permanent base, you can go into a grocery store and gorge, take whatever you need with you and just move on. Uh, you could find your own food in supply wherever you go. And if the area that you have is zapped, you just leave and go to another area. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely something to consider and think about. Uh, but you also have to remember folks, like you all said, if you don't have a vehicle, this can actually be very detrimental to you because being overweight or being encumbered is very problematic because you just lose uh, a lot of stamina and you can't sprint for long times. And honestly, while you can walk away from most of these zombies, there are situa most situations where you need to gain distance from them to be able to break line of sight. So you can try to not have a collective horde following you down the main road for about two to three miles because that's one of the issues that you have to remember, folks. Without a base as a nomad, um, your supplies can not only hamper your speed, but they can also lead that horde back to your car. And if you're not fast enough to get in your car and drive off, they may surround your car and literally bust everything off of it. 100% could not agree more. I think the other con to nomadic life and why walking isn't exactly an option going from one side to the other is that in the summertime you will get overheated you can get sick from it and you will dehydrate quicker and if you're in the middle of kentucky like right next to Muldrow, there isn't always water to drink so that's something you have to consider but then there's the other side where if you're on foot walking in the winter time you can get hypothermia you can get sick from the cold and you could freeze to death so having that car is critical because you can turn the heater on or Turn the AC on. Uh, I don't know if Dimension 119 is still here, but one of the things I want to do to him is give him a car, but turn the heater on max and just see how long it takes him to realize that that's, that's a thing. <laughs> oh, uh, that's terrible. Great. <laughs> but, but I definitely prefer the nomadic life. I do more of a hybrid, you know, like we're starting off in the mansion, but that's just because we're going against 55,000 zombies. Whereas, oh, and not only one helicopter event, our helicopter event is sometimes. So it's not just a one and done and then we can forget about it. It will always be a threat. But nomadic life sucks too, because if you're a nomad and that helicopter comes, it will follow you if it sees you. You have to completely break line of sight with it for it to go away. And it, even then it takes a while and it will lead every zombie within he hearing uh, radius. Doesn't matter if there's a hundred, 
or a thousand, all of them are going to be coming after you. But this is something I want to throw to the community. When when you play these survival games, what's your favorite survival method? Are you more the base builder? Are you a homesteader? Or are you a wanderer and a nomad? Or maybe a hybrid of both? I'd love to hear what you guys think. And if you prefer one play style over the other, well then, which games would you like to see those other play styles featured in? I know we've talked about it. I would love for Sons of the Forest to have more of an encouragement to be primitive survival instead of, okay, we need to build walls, traps, log cabins. I'd love to see that a lot more. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and if you guys don't have anything to say now, maybe this is a conversation we could see in the comments too, because this is this is a big point and I think a foundation piece to any survival game. You know, with Raft, it's a nomadic game, but it's also a base building game because you have to expand your Raft. Um, I think at a certain point though, it becomes kind of redundant and, and you get burned out because you can't get away from your base. It's something you always need, but it's something I'm, I've always been interested in when I play a game. No, I actually did a video about this for Daisy a while back, and I think it actually pertains to this subject very interestingly. I did a video talking about base building in Daisy because Daisy base building is either you love it or you hate it, right? Well, I kind of was trying to point out to people that base building in Daisy, now this is just Daisy, of course, I'm talking about other games. There is a level of, I would say, attachment to things. My overall, I guess I would say, point in this is that if you don't play DayZ and you go, oh, I don't like base building, then don't use uh, tents, don't use barrels, don't use stashes. Only carry what you can on your character because anything outside of your character's inventory is a form of long-term base building. Yeah, especially with the tents. Oh, we've got a comment here. 330T says, Nomad, but many stash locations. Now, see, that is smart. That is something that I do in DayZ a lot. One of my biggest survival tips in DayZ is if you have an over excess of canned food and you're worried you're going to lose it all, find yourself a dry bag, put the canned food in it, dig a hole, bury it, and mark it on your map or have put it in a place that you know where it is. That way you can continue to be nomadic. And even if you die and respawn, you can at least get something to dig it up and go to that place where you know you have that dry bag with those supplies in it. Oh, totally, totally. I uh, very much agree on that. And you can also do that on Project Zomboid, uh, maybe not trying to hide it from other players, but you can actually create stash locations and mark it on your map now that that's built mm -hmm. into the game. That way you can be all like, there's food here, which actually actually probably is a very good way to play that nomadic lifestyle because then you could be all like, hey, I was looting this town. I didn't find any food. My character is starving. Well, now you know where you stash that extra food you found a couple of weeks, um, days ago. That's true. As long as you have a pencil or a pen, you can mark it on your map, which is super useful. Also, if you're somewhat skilled at carpentry, you could build a crate in the middle of the forest and put supplies in the crate. Like you said, it doesn't have to be hidden. And if somebody gets to it and you come back and it's empty, well, you know what? That's just c'est la vie. You know, as a nomad, you love running into other people. As a base builder, you have like we can't allow you in because we're stretched on supply if somebody hit up one of my stashes and took the food at least it went to somebody who needed it i can always find more or you get to hunt somebody i mean what what <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh let's go ahead and let's see in today's podcast we talked about base building we talked about searching. we talked about games that do it well we talk about games that don't do it well but Primarily, there is no right or wrong way to run a survival game. There's always going to be people who prefer that base building. It's one of the reasons why like, people love Fallout 76. I think Fallout 76 has a phenomenal base building system. Uh, and why people like me, who's kind of a trash panda, don't really like games like that. Uh, but it's always fun to see games that do a proper hybrid. And I think Project Zomboid definitely fits that. 
definitely. I, I, I agree on that one. It definitely is a very fun hybrid, but kind of like you've been pointing out this entire episode is that Project Zomboid is one of the true sandbox games out there where you really can kind of play how you want to play. Um, I know in Build 42, they're introducing more stuff, so maybe trapping is going to be far more viable because leather, tanning, pelts. Um, and also, I did read, this is going to be cool, folks, it's going to introduce more bad sandbox mode. They're going to be introducing a pure wilderness maps, vanilla pure wilderness maps and stuff That's like that. super cool. So it's going to really kind of spice things up with Project Zomboid because I'm not sure if those wilderness maps will actually include um vanilla wise uh zombies you know and the interesting thing too about them providing more hunting and stuff we can't forget that right after that in build 43 they're going to start implementing npcs Our, my strategy may change in a few months if i gotta worry about bandits with guns roaming the streets or riding their bicycles down the highway i might have some problems with it but Let's talk about next week's episode. I think on Thursday, we are going to be playing Daisy on the stream to celebrate the official release of 1.21. And I'm super excited for that. Uh, I can't wait to hit these, you know, the, the city with you and maybe even meet in the woods, but I want to see everything. I want to see the new sounds. I want to see the new lighting, the armor, the crossbows. I mean, I am excited for all of it. It may not have seemed like that big of a deal update to a lot of people, but the fixes behind it are what really makes this a gem. So I'm super excited. I am too. I'm definitely very excited. And we're going to be doing that, what, Thursday again? Yeah, we're going to be doing it Thursday. And if, you know, there's somebody above that's watching down below, hopefully they'll get me out of jury duty so I could be here next Tuesday to talk about it because I'm going to be really excited about it. Yes, definitely. And it also brings us up, folks. If Jarl of Goats does have jury duty, unfortunately, he will not be here to join us. However, the show will go on. Do not worry. That's right, everyone. I might not be here, which means you'll actually enjoy the podcast a lot more. So tune in next week, even though I may be absent. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Tom. Oh, I, I love how I went up to Dump and I was like, this is what I want to talk about. He goes, go for it. And I, I just love the freedom the podcast gives because there's so much to talk about when it comes to survival games. And I was super happy, happy to hit this one up. Well, well very fun. thank you, everyone. Thank you, fellow survivors. We will see you next week. Bye bye. Stay safe. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching our video and this podcast episode. Please like and subscribe, and it definitely helps us when you do. Please remember that you can also comment down below, and who knows, maybe we'll read or talk about your comment in our next episodes. Folks, I also want you to make sure to thank our staff members, being Yarla Goats and Red Falcon. Yarla Goats streams on Twitch quite regularly, and Red Falcon is responsible for the Red Falcon Heli mods on the Daisy Workshop on PC. We're happy to have you folks here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.